I believe all of us will be proud of the Millennium experience, and the year 2000 will be a time we look back on with pride and pleasure. Words from Tony Blair, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom during the change into the third millennium. The new millennium brought many experiences to the world, but one UK attraction was specifically designed to last one year and be a celebration of it, and it was a weird one. Dome. One amazing day. One year only. In the early 1990s, questions began to be asked about the upcoming new millennium. How should it be celebrated? Who should celebrate it? And who would pay for it? In 1992, the idea of marking the millennium in a special way began to be discussed when it turned up in the Conservative Party's election manifesto. With the Conservative government at the time committed to low taxes and tight control on public spending, where would the money actually come from for this? So where would you find an extra thousand pounds? The answer was the National Lottery Act. The Millennium Commission was set up in 1993 to act as a distributor of lottery funds and award grant money that would in some way mark the new millennium. By 1994, it was proposed to spend the money it expected to receive from the lottery in three ways. On capital projects, grants to individuals, and to fund a festival to mark the year 2000. Running and creation of a festival for the new millennium had never been planned or achieved before, so a few rules would be created. It would have to be held at a single site, it should have at least a 10 million visitor capacity, it should be ran for a year, and at least half of the visitors could arrive by public transport. The festival also had to leave a legacy. A competition was held for site locations. Four preferred sites emerged. Birmingham National Exhibition Centre, the NEC, the Derby Pride site, Stratford in East London, and the Greenwich Peninsula. The top two runners considered for the location were the Birmingham NEC, a well-established arena that had been holding exhibitions for years and located in the centre of the country, or Greenwich, on an area of land which had been empty for 20 years in an urban area that needed an economical boost. This site could be used though to leave that legacy the plan required in a similar vein to the World Fairs. In 1996, it was announced by the Millennium Commission that Greenwich would be the Millennium site. It was not going to be the easy option. As the home of world time, Greenwich seemed suited for such a celebration, but the area itself at the time had high levels of unemployment, with over 500 businesses and 10,000 jobs lost in just two years. The hope was this project would bring the city eastwards to kickstart a post-industrial regeneration. The area though was rich in history, originally a fishing village and later a Roman resort, it was also visited by many monarchs who hunted in the park and built palaces beside the river. Henry VIII was actually born in Greenwich. In 1884, Greenwich was adopted as the prime meridian time of the world and would be where the third millennium officially began. The site now though was abandoned and polluted with little infrastructure bordered on three sides by the River Thames. The largest gaswork in Europe once had its home on the site and the site had been left derelict for over 20 years after its closure. The land itself was polluted with chemicals and tar which had been dumped there. The owners of the land, British Gas, had attempted to clean it up when the site was selected, but it remained polluted. It also had a tunnel running under part of the land and unknown ground conditions. Not really a great place to begin work on leaving that legacy in less than four years. The plan was to have 12 main pavilions grouped around a circular arena. Around the outside was 12 spheres that would tour the country and each location having some form of event surrounding it before it was transported to London. It became clear though that this proposal was going to be too expensive and the plan was rejected. The other issue found that was due to the winds from the river, the site was freezing to walk around and the event was to run all year long. With just a few years to go until the new millennium, there was still no site plan, no planning permission placed and no ideas what the actual contents inside would be. Whatever the new design they came up with though would have to save time. Rather than having 12 individual pavilions built, they would put it all under one roof thus saving time and more importantly, saving costs. The dome itself appears relatively simple, but is a marvel of engineering. It's not an upside down saucer, but rather a structure pulling out from the ground. 
It would feature 12 main supports representing each month of the year or each hour on the clock face. In June 1997, the dome was officially given the go-ahead. The plans would change from building a temporary building to a permanent one with a change of the roof material. The dome began construction in 1998. 52 meters high and 365 meters in diameter, representing the weeks and days of the year. It is along the Thames River in Greenwich. It is the size of two Georgia domes, to give you some sense of what it is equal to in this country or in the United States. The creation, changes, and construction of this building could be talked about for hours, but it is what is inside after opening that we're going to be looking at. There are about 12,000 invited guests there tonight. And then it is a theme park all around with 14 different centers that reflect science and parts of British life and faith and uh, medicine and a number of things. It is a participatory place where people can come and tour these various centers as well as see uh, theatrical acts uh, in the middle. Market research had started looking at what the experience could be. Was the Millennium Celebration a party? Looking back at the past or looking towards the future? Or was it a time for reflection? In the end, it turned out that the stronger desire for the millennium was to mark a change for the better. A bright, more hopeful future. It was time to make a difference, and that became the core concept for the new experience. The dome at Greenwich, the biggest dome in the world, and the first wonder of the new millennium. It's on the Greenwich Peninsula, on the Meridian Line, where time literally begins. Nine core ideas emerged. For each zone, a 15-page brief was prepared detailing the aspirations and the balance between education, information, and fun that it should provide, as well as information on the size and space and the throughput of the visitors. Each of the zones will be designed by different designers, some larger companies who had experience with exhibitions and some by smaller groups who were less known but looked as if their ideas were intriguing. The designers were given six weeks for research and design work to come up with models, presentations, and give an indication of the budget of the zone. Once all the pitches were in, the final selection of designers were made by October 1997. The dome finally had its experiences set. The central area of the dome had been planned to hold a big show which would provide a shared experience. Sir Cameron McIntosh, who had a selection of West End hits, was invited to look at the creation of this central attraction. The show continued to grow in scope and costs with a drum theatre show until the idea for the show was rejected and the scheme dropped. Ten months into the project, the centre of the dome had nothing planned. Many of the people behind the project were happy as the plan was to build a large expensive structure in the centre and its rejection meant that the centre could be more open. It also meant the scaled down show would now open up more room inside the dome for more zones. The drum theatre was planned to take the entire central area of the dome up to the ring masks. More zones though meant more sponsors and more visitor capacity. The zones increased from 9 to 14. The zones themselves though had no overall creative vision. The Millennium Experience was designed to be varied. Many different experiences all under one roof. Nowhere else is doing anything like it. And it promises and will be the most fantastic day out in the world. The dome opened on the 1st of January 2000. The majority of visitors arrived from the newly constructed North Greenwich Tube Station, passing by various art installations on the way. Outside of the dome was the Meridian Quarter. North of the dome, it opened an open riverside landscape with impressive views. Greenwich Pavilion housed an exhibition putting the dome into context, explaining how Greenwich had become the home of time and creation of the dome. The water cycle was a water system that used rainwater from the dome's roof, cleaned the water, and reused it in the bathrooms throughout the dome. It was one of the first to be able to do so. Skyscape was a dramatic silver building with futuristic looking roof sails. Designed as an entertainment venue, it was a key part of the visitor experience. The cinema inside would show two specially written comedies. A short film, The Good Ship Citizen, followed by Blackadder Back and Forth. 
by night, the Skyscape was London's newest entertainment venue, with a stage hosting separately ticketed performances during the year 2000. By the way, one final question before I impale you with my magnificent weapon, and I'm not talking about yes, my yes, enormous... Yes, yes, I know you're not. Oh, right, sorry. So, let's take a look at some of the aspects of the 14 zones inside, and I am telling you now, some of them are really odd. The first zone we're going to talk about is body, and it aimed to be thought provoking and still a sense of wonder about our bodies. Part building and part sculpture, it featured two seven story high figures, one male and one female. Sponsored by Boots, as you entered you were shrunk and surrounded by blood vessels, and it also included a chance to see our skin up close with walls of flesh. What else was in here you ask? Well animatronic pubic lice. Next was the Mind Zone, which explored the nature of perception, sponsored by BAE Systems and Marconi, both arms manufacturers. Inside, you pass through four areas exploring different aspects of the mind. The first area, the Robot Zoo, had working robots, which stopped working after a few months and was replaced with a static illusion. Displays stopping working was a constant issue throughout the year experience. The Faith Zone didn't have a sponsor, but that was due to it being criticised early in planning. Some found it too politically correct, and others found it too Christianity focused. The zone began with a sculpture of a newborn child and a short film in which children of different faiths shared their thoughts about God. Graphics portrayed the nine major faiths within the UK, and a display showed the impact of Christianity on the UK, as well as how different faiths mark different life experiences. The South Portrait Zone was sponsored by Marks and Spencer. It celebrated British diversity at the beginning of the new millennium. From the outside, the zone is a huge glowing circular drum. Revolving panels revealed hundreds of objects selected in the response to the question, what is one thing that represents Britain to you? The next section was Work. Sponsored by Manpower, it had a clear sponsor influence. You were greeted by robotic hamsters on wheels, and displays declaring what guests would need to do to stay employable. The Zone explored the idea of technology replacing people in working jobs. The Zone also had a skills workshop where you could get a skills passport to prove you were worthy, and it also had the world's largest foosball game. This Zone was not a guest favourite. It was also connected to the Learning Zone above it, sponsored by Tesco. Again, talking about how employers needed employees able and willing to learn new skills. The Zone was in parts, with the first being a recreation of school life, with smells pumped in such as boiled cabbage and disinfectant. A film called The Magic Seed shows how a life of a bored 11 year old girl is changed for the better by a wise teacher. The third area was the Infinite Orchard, surrounding you with trees and 50 mirror cubes equipped with computer screens, before exiting and seeing how technology is already helping children learn to use the internet. The rest zone within the dome was billed as the dome's relaxation chamber, a rainbow coloured curved shape set against a sea of black that stepping inside you could experience a deep calm. You were able to sit and lay as long as you liked, layers of light and colour gently evolved around you, and an original score was created for the room called Long Player, which was designed to take 1000 years to play fully. After all that skill requirements for work learning, the next zone was called Play. This one had to be fun though, right? Let's see what the guidebook says. Play is a fundamental part of life. It allows us to challenge ourselves and discover things we did not know we could do. Uh, okay, hmm. So far it doesn't sound fun, but let's give it a chance. With the advancements of technology, how we play is changing. As you enter, six sculptures make us think about the different kinds of play possible. While not sounding fun, it did feature a variety of games inside to play. One of which was Armchair Goalie. It had one player saving goals from an armchair using their digitally animated goalkeeper. The lines though to play these games could get really long. On exiting you saw the same six sculptures, but this time animated with effects encouraging you to find a new way of playing in the future. We have to be cost conscious, we have to make sure revenue is coming in, and then we focus everybody around the fact that visitor is our key. Visitor is what we want. You know, we're in the making people happy business. He says he'll cut queues by making sure people visit every part of the dome, not just the popular body zone. Talk was next, sponsored by BT. It had one of the strangest corporate content tie-ins yet. It had telecommunication technology throughout history from 4000 BC, with smoke signals, all the way to the internet. Upstairs you reached an area about the future of communication. And who did you meet there? Well of course, it was E.T. You could get your picture taken with E.T. himself and send it by email. Why was E.T. there? Well at the time, B.T. were running an ad campaign featuring E.T. and the message phone home. 
so E.T. became a part of the Millennium Experience, thanks to the sponsors. The Money Zone is the one for me that stands out most in my memory from my visit for some reason. Sponsored by the Corporation of London, you entered down a corridor lined with 20,000 real £50 notes. It aimed to link our financial lives with the financial world around us. You were able to spend a million pounds using a gold spend card on a shopping cart shaped computer and you would have a minute to buy goods with it and learn about investing your money. Journey was sponsored by Ford and it was the most museum like of all the zones covering a general history of transportation with a look towards the future. Oh, and it also had James Bond's boat from The World Is Not Enough, as in the movie he rolled down the roof of the building. Shared Ground featured the BBC children's show Blue Peter and had mock streets and alleys where kids could record their thoughts about their neighbourhoods and explore the importance of neighbours and communities in our lives. The messages were placed in a time capsule, so far never to be seen again. Living Island had you travel through a tunnel of love and inside was an enclosed model of the British island built with recycled materials. Home Planet was sponsored by British Airways and it was the only ride in the dome, a revolving theatre ride in the same style of Disney's Carousel of Progress where two aliens, Gaia and her son Max, guided you through deep space to a beautiful planet. The shock twist though was it was the Earth all along. All of the landscapes seen were life-size dioramas using practical effects. <laughs> The attraction offered many different entertaining acts throughout and other small exhibits were sprinkled around and inside the building, including Timekeepers, which was one of the more popular zones in the dome, basically a jungle gym featuring cogs and sprinks. The other notable aspect was the Millennium Jewels, 12 diamonds worth £200 million, which were most well known for an attempted robbery of them in November 2000. A local gang rammed a JCB into the dome to steal them and planned to escape down the Thames in a speedboat. No, not the one from James Bond. They did not succeed. As you can see, each zone was highly different from each other, and the amount of weirdness inside varied, and it was up to the Millennium Show to try and tie the vision of the new Millennium together. Located in the centre of the dome, the show was designed by Mark Fisher and composed by Peter Gabriel. The story of the show was supposed to follow three generations of a family divided by internal struggle. The story was not easy to understand, but at least it used acrobatics and flame jets so it was fun to watch. It featured two rotating cars performing five times a day for the whole year. I think the area that it's plugged into for, for me for years, you know, I've wanted to try and get involved in uh, an experience park. That was the, the concept, it was sort of an amusement park, but designed by our, our, the most interesting artists and scientists of the, of the day. The Dome was the subject of much negative media coverage and public opinion from the start to many years afterwards. And another thing, that Dome. What's the point of that then, eh? Blooming great marquee. Wouldn't waste me time going. Apparently, I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> If you've got a mind of your own, take it to the dome. The lines were long and many people did not get to experience everything inside. It was crowded and offered little seating throughout, parking was terrible and you had to pretty much take the tube to get to it, and its weird mix of exhibits created an image problem. Was it a theme park? A museum? Nobody was really sure and nobody left satisfied. The biggest complaint of all though was the cost. By the time of its closure, the project had cost £789 million. Visitors fell far short of expectations to make it profitable. Tony Blair and the Labour Party significantly increased expectations of what it would offer and it didn't meet them. It repeatedly needed more funds and had numerous changes at management level before and during the event. The Dome's now cut its visitor target from 12 million to 10, but they say ticket sales are good. The guest prediction forecast was 12 million guests during its 12 month operation. In reality, it received 6.5 million. Still, it was the most visited tourist attraction of the year, followed by the London Eye. Overall, though, the Millennium Experience was a failure. And loved and criticised for being a shameful waste of taxpayers' money, the venue spent six years mostly vacant. The government's trouble to sell the dome began the subject of even more critical comments and was reported to cost £1 million a month to maintain the dome. 
Most of the zones inside were destroyed or removed by the sponsoring organisation and some of them were auctioned off after the dome closed. Debate continued for the dome's future use. It reopened in 2003 for the Winter Wonderland experience and was used for a small number of music festivals, but most of the time it sat abandoned. By late 2000, the plan was to build a high-tech business park under the tent, creating an indoor city, but that never happened. Later, it was planned to be a sports and entertainment centre. Eventually, it would become an entertainment facility costing £600 million to develop. It was officially renamed the O2 and the inside was completely reimagined with an arena still taking up the centre of the now iconic dome. It officially reopened in 2007. The Millennium experience though had been a failure. Its poor execution, misleading expectations and weird mix of content inside only existed for one year. One report stated children as saying they had more fun at school than visiting the attraction, and I have to say I agree from my visit. From what I remember, only the weirdness really stands out as memorable. One thing that comes to mind for me when thinking about my visit to the attraction as a whole, and that is the parallel to Disney's Epcot Park. The educational future tone, sponsorship influence, and ultimately failure of the concept. In the end though, the Millennium Experience certainly did not leave a legacy. It was planned to be a beacon to the world. It ended up being just an empty building which was eventually repurposed and the Millennium Experience was forgotten. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Expedition Extinct. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to join us on the expedition. A special thank you to our Patreons for supporting the channel. Take a look at our Patreon to get early releases of upcoming videos, and right now sign up to get an Expedition theme park badge and postcard. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram for sneak peeks of upcoming expeditions. Did you visit the Millennium Experience in London? Let me know what you thought of the attraction in the comments below, and we will see you next time.